Hello, I'm Nina DeLeo, Executive Director of the Victoria Bach Festival, and I want to welcome you to the 2020 Victoria Bach Festival. Now, one of our popular Victoria Bach Festival offerings are our off-season house concerts, where people can get a, a real close-up glimpse with our artists and enjoy some food and drink. And tonight we're presenting what we might think of as a house concert at a distance. We'll get a glimpse into what an evening of music in the home of Anna Magdalena and Johann Sebastian Bach might have sounded like. Now, George Stauffer and Renee Ann Lupret have been joining us in Victoria for the past three years now, and Renee's organ recitals and George's pre-concert lectures have become some of our most anticipated programs of the festival week. So we're very glad to be able to join George and Renee at a distance tonight for an evening at home with Johann Sebastian. The sponsors for tonight's concert are Kay and Ron Walker, and our season sponsors are the City of Victoria, the Texas Commission on the Arts, and the O'Connor and Hewitt Foundation. <clears throat> Speaking of the O'Connor and Hewitt Foundation, Robert Hewitt Jr., the past director of the foundation, passed away this spring. Robert was a man of great curiosity and generosity, and his philanthropic reach throughout the city of Victoria has been felt by nonprofits throughout the community. He's missed, and his dedication to the continuity of nonprofits in Victoria will be long remembered. And now it's time for some traveling, if only in our imaginations. We can travel both back in time and distance to the early 18th century Leipzig and to Somerset, New Jersey, where we get to spend some time in the home of Rene Anne Lucret and George Stauffer. Thanks for this special evening, George. Thank you, Nina, and greetings to one and all from Somerset, New Jersey. Uh, Rene and I are delighted to take part in this Victoria Bach Festival broadcast and thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I'd like to start um, with some thanks to Nina and her team down there in Victoria uh, for handling the practical and the technical arrangements that make this broadcast uh, work. Uh, I also want to give a second shout out to Kay and Ron Walker, good friends from the festival, uh, whose strong financial support uh, has made this event possible. And I also want to thank uh, Larry Trupiano, the organ curator of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and also Rutgers University, who came by last week with his crew to tune our organ. Renee and I wish we were in Victoria for the festival, uh, having lunches at Jason's Deli and dinner at the Pump House, but COVID-19 has forced us to change plans and broadcast directly from our home in New Jersey. Our goal is to recreate the kind of evening that you might have experienced if you had visited Sebastian Bach and his wife Anna Magdalena in their home in Leipzig, Germany, using the instruments in our house to play music that they knew and loved. Let me set the scene by sharing with you um, some slides of uh, Bach's house and then our house. Now I'm going to go into screen share and... You should be seeing uh, the St. Thomas School, the Thomas Schule, as it appeared on May 22nd, 1723, when the box arrived. That's the St. Thomas Church in Leipzig, directly in front of you. On the left is the St. Thomas School. Uh, as many of you know, Bach was not only a prolific composer, but he was also a prolific father and uh, had 20 children uh, by two wives. Uh, with this expanding family, it was necessary to rebuild the St. Thomas School nine years later. And here's how it looked in 1732 with the rebuild. Um, Bach's apartment was on the left there by the arrow. That's the door into which he would enter to go home. Here's a, a watercolor by Felix Mendelssohn uh, painted in 1839 showing the St. Thomas School uh, from the rear. That's the church on the left, the school on the right. And here's how the St. Thomas School appeared in 1900. Much to everyone's horror, two years later, the building was demolished and all that's left is the door to Bach's apartment, which you can see if you go to the Bach Museum in Leipzig. Here's our home, a bit more humble, uh, but equally elegant. And inside, uh, we have our Flentrop pipe organ. Uh, this is in the, the living room. 
Uh, this instrument was built in 1960 in Holland, and it was a spin-off, we might say, the famous Flintrop organ at the Bush Reisinger Museum at Harvard that E. Power Biggs used to record on. Uh, in our music room, we have a harpsichord. This is a Flemish instrument uh, made in 73 and modeled after a Rukers harpsichord of 1640. Here's a painting by Terborg from 1675 that shows you that exact kind of instrument and also uh, with the same coloring. Now I'm going to go out of screen share. I should be back with you now. Good. Uh, we'd like to start with a work not by Bach, but by his organ teacher, Georg Böhm. Bach studied with Böhm in Lüneburg, Germany, and copied uh, pieces of his um, music when he uh, was in the house when he was just 15 years old. Böhm's Partita on Freudisch Zer O Meine Seele is a small set of variations on the chorale, Rejoice Greatly, O My Soul. Such pieces were often played at home for evening devotions, and they're perfect for showing off the registrational colors of an organ whose stops are changed with every variation. Uh, thus, we thought it would be a good way to introduce you to our Flintrop house organ. Uh, as you listen and watch, you will see and hear Rene change stops between each movement and displaying the different sounds of the instrument. Here's Berm's Partita on Freudisch Zer, uh, with the chorale played first, followed by six variations.
So next we'll turn to Bach himself in a small intimate piece that works well on a small intimate organ. The Pastorella in F major is a composition from Bach's maturity written during the Leipzig years. Pastoral pieces were traditionally played on Christmas Eve to celebrate the visit of the shepherds to the Christ child in Bethlehem. And they normally feature gently swaying themes to portray the gentle rocking of Christ's cradle. Bach's Pastorella is a small dance suite with four movements, pastoral, musette, air, and jig. Uh, the work uses pedal for the first movement only to portray the drones of the shepherd's bagpipes. Here's Bach's Pastorella in F major in four movements. <laughs>
We would now like to take you into the Bach household via Anna Magdalena Bach's Clavier Buchlein or Little Clavier Book of 1725. That was a gift from Bach to his wife, Anna Magdalena, who was a professional singer and also played the harpsichord. He had the album bound in handsome green leather and embossed with gold leaf. Insider entries by members of the Bach family of favorite pieces by other composers, by Bach and by the Bach sons to play and sing in the house, in the home uh, as evening entertainment. It was the Baroque equivalent of Netflix. Here's what it looked like. Let me show you a few pages. Yeah, here's the album itself. You can see the green leather, handsome green leather still and the gold embossing around the edges. Uh, here's an entry by um, uh, Christian Petzold, who was the organist in Dresden, a minuet. Here's a French piece, Les Bergeries, The Sheepfolds by Francois Couperin, organist in Paris. Here's an excerpt uh, from a Bach cantata, from cantata 82, uh, the aria Schlummert Ein, uh, transposed to Anna Magdalena's range. It's a slumber song with the text, slumber now, you eyes so weary. Now, in the cantata, this of course referred to the slumber of death, but in the Bach household, performed in the evening, it may have referred to the slumber of the Bach children so that uh, Johann Sebastian and Anna Magdalena could get some uh, peace themselves. Here's um, an entry by a 15 year old, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, A Small March. And here's another march by the 10 year old Johann Christian Bach. You can see that uh, Johann Sebastian stepped in, Fati stepped in and made a few corrections along the way. Uh, Rene will now play the first two selections on our Flemish harpsichord. Here's the Minuet by Christian Petzold of Dresden and Les Bergeries by Francois Couperin of Paris.
Anna Magdalena's album also contained poems of the semi-serious nature. Uh, Bach was a pipe smoker, and so it's not altogether surprising to find in the album the short doggerel edifying thoughts of a tobacco smoker. Let me read it for you. Whene'er I take my pipe and stuff it and smoke to pass the time away, my thoughts as I sit there and puff it dwell on a picture sad and gray. It teaches me that very like am I myself unto my pipe. Like me, this pipe so fragrant burning is made of naught but earth and clay. To earth I too shall be returning. It falls in air I'd think to say, it breaks in two before my eyes, in store for me a like fate lies. No stain the pipe's hue yet doth darken, it remains white. Thus do I know that when to death's call I must hearken, my body too, all pale, will grow. To black beneath the sod twill turn, likewise the pipe, if oft it burn. Or when the pipe is fairly glowing, behold then instantaneously the smoke off into, in, into thin air going, till naught but ash is left to see. Man's fame likewise away will burn, and on to dust his body turn. How oft it happens when one smoking, the stopper's missing from its shelf, and one goes with one's finger poking into the bowl and burns oneself. If in the pipe such pain doth dwell, how hot must be the coals of hell. Thus, o'er my pipe in contemplation of such things, I can constantly indulge in fruitful meditation and so puffing contentedly on land, on sea, at home, abroad, I smoke my pipe and I think of God. With those edifying thoughts, I will turn the program back to Renee, who will play two more selections from Anna Magdalena Bach's little clavier book. Two small pieces composed by the Bach sons. First, a march in D major by the 15-year-old Carl Philip Emanuel, and then the march in F major by the 10-year-old Johann Christian Bach. In the last decade of his life, Bach wrote some very progressive pieces for lute, probably for Silvius Leopold Weiss, uh, one of the foremost lutenists in Europe, a member of the Dresden Court Orchestra, and also a frequent visitor in the Bach household in Leipzig. Among these pieces is a highly unusual fugue from the prelude, fugue, and allegro in E flat major, 
uh, that's written in the manner of an opera aria uh, with an A section, then a contrasting B section, and then a de capo or a literal repeat of the A section. Fugues aren't supposed to work that way. Uh, they should unfold continuously without sections or repeats. But Bach, perhaps under pressure from his uh, younger sons, wrote this very forward-looking fugue with clear-cut sections and a repeat like the works of Mozart's time. As my good colleague Bob Marshall might put it, here's Bach writing in the style of Mozart. The Bach's lute works were frequently performed on a Lautenwerk, a lute harpsichord. Uh, we don't have one here at the house, but Rene will simulate one on our Flemish instrument by using the lute stop for the opening section of the fugue and its repeat at the end. She'll take off the lute stop in the middle section by way of contrast. Uh, you can see her reaching into the harpsichord to do this, and you can hear the contrast and sound. Lute stop, no lute stop, lute stop. Here's Bach's fugue in E-flat major for lute or lute harpsichord.
Little needs to be said about the Fantasy and Fugue in C minor, a fantastic late organ work by Bach, possibly his very last statement on the prelude and fugue. But the Fantasia sounds almost romantic, uh, with mournful melodic themes imitating sighing and weeping. The fugue is, guess what, another De Capo fugue. Uh, how, many, how many concerts have you heard with two De Capo fugues in one go? Uh, this one is, uh, opens with a very dynamic theme that jumps rapidly up and then down, and then that's followed by a middle section with a contrasting theme that climbs slowly upward, step by step. The fugue is dense, tense, and utterly dynamic. Here's Bach's Fantasy and Fugue in C minor for organ.
Now, after that dramatic performance, I would imagine Bach's family and friends jumped to their feet, clapping and yelling, to Gaba, Fati, to Gaba, uh, encore, Papa, encore. Uh, responding in our virtual environment, Rene will play as an encore, the last movement from Bach's organ transcription of the concerto in G major, written by his Weimar patron, Prince Johann Ernst. Bach's welfare in Weimar was in the hands of the prince, one of the three leaders of the court royal family. Bach had to impress, he had to make a good impression, and he did. Here to end our house concert is the presto from the concerto in G major. I'm muted, I'm clapping muted, it was so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Renee, for your beautiful playing. We have lots of comments here about how beautifully articulated it is and how moving it is. And George, how, how your talks are always so engaging and fun and informative. So thank you so much for bringing this here to us tonight. We do have a few questions here. I'm gonna start with one from Chris Haritatos, our, our cellist, our Baroque cellist from, from Rochester, New York. He's asking how it was discovered that the Petzold was the composer of the minuet and that CPE was the composer of the march in D. Do you know a little bit about that? How they came to that conclusion? Uh, the Petzold, for many years, uh, the minuet was assumed to be Bach. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Hans Joachim Schulze found it in a suite of um, music by Petzold in a Dresden library, in the, in the State Library in Dresden. Uh, this was around 1986. So it was box up to 1986, but after 86, it went to Petzold. Uh, I remember learning it as a Bach piece, absolutely. Yeah, I think a lot of people learned it that way. Many others, but I hate to say it, it's uh, it Petzold. But a Bach is to be applauded for having good taste. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, it's very tuneful, which is why it's in the album. Uh, the CPE Bach, we know is CPE Bach because it's uh, CPE Bach's handwriting, which is very... Uh -huh distinctive, and we assume uh, that he would have entered his own pieces as the Johann Christian Bach, which was only recently assigned to Johann Christian Bach, is also his youthful handwriting. So there you have to go by the handwriting rather than the author. Fascinating. Mark an author, yeah. We have a question about the, the harpsichord and who the maker of the harpsichord might be. <laughs> Your home harpsichord. 
Uh, I'm the maker of the home harpsichord. Uh, that Fantastic. Was, that was a, a Zuckerman kit that I built in 1973 uh, during my first year of graduate study at uh, Columbia University. And it was inaugurated uh, by none other than Christoph Wolf, uh, who was a professor at Columbia at the time. And he came over and played some Spelink and Cooper and uh, inaugurated the instruments. So um, I'm proud to say it's, it's my handiwork. Beautiful. Tell us a little bit about that process. So you, you get the kit and then it's a lot of, a lot of learning and piecing and tuning and- uh, Yeah, you buy, um, you, you buy a kit and all the wood parts are there and there's a, a copious uh, instruction manual, a very thick instruction manual. And um, you put it together like a, a huge model set. Uh, my forebears were Tischler, uh, were cabinet makers. And uh, I like to work with my hands and I like to work with wood very much so it was a labor of love. But I should add as a sad footnote uh, that I attempted to build a two manual instrument and uh, that was too much and I simply had to turn it over to Willard Martin in Bethlehem, PA who uh, finished it up. So I advise you uh, don't go beyond a Flemish if you're building a model harpsichord. Well, that is a perfect segue because we do have a question about that, about what the difference might be between a French and a Flemish harpsichord. Okay, um, should I take that? Mm -hmm. um, well, Flemish harpsichord uh, generally were smaller, uh, one manual, they were built in the early part of the 17th century. And the reason why they were so successful is that they found the perfect balance between sturdiness, that is the strings would not literally pull the thing together, but rather the bracing would uh, uh, hold the instrument stable and allow you to have uh, all the strings in there without it uh, uh, collapsing. But also uh, that it was um, still of light construction and had a wonderful sound. The French uh, stole the bracing from Rukers, from the, the Flemish builders, and essentially they uh, expanded the Flemish model to two manuals and uh, increased the size and the range of the harpsichord. But a French harpsichord uh, by Tascan, for instance, is really an enlarged Rukers instrument uh, from the previous century, Tascan working in the 18th century. Fascinating. So take a good thing and make it bigger, huh? Correct. We have a lot of interest here in the poem, in the pipe smoker poem. So can you tell us where that comes from and how you came across it? Um, sure, that's from Anna Magdalena's uh, Clavier Buchlein. Uh, it's in the book. And that particular translation was uh, made by Arthur Mendel of Princeton University, who had a real flair for interpreting uh, German poetry and coming up with um, apt translations in English. And unfortunately, that's not in the new Bach reader. You have to go to the old Bach reader, the Bach reader that was published by Norton in 1966, uh, to find that. It's in the back of the uh, old Bach reader, not the new Bach reader. Well, Michael Hummel here in Victoria is saying that listening to the commentary tonight, he's tempted to stoke up one of his old pipes. <laughs> and he and Cora Jo would also like to invite you and, and Renee over for drinks and food after this program. Uh, Unfortunately, I'm not sure how that's gonna happen, but we can all try. <laughs> well, Renee, it was such gorgeous playing. Thank you so much for, and tell, tell us a little bit about how this program came together. I know, again, this theme of having, but there's so much music to choose from that they played in their home. So how did you come to choose these pieces? Yes, thank you so much, Nina, for this wonderful opportunity to participate in the festival again in this way. Um, people will have surmised by this point that all of my tracks were pre-recorded. Um, actually, so, so when you extended the invitation to us, we set up a timeline together of when each of these tracks would reasonably reach you so that um, the, the video could then be synced with the audio and eventually the subtitles be added to the beginning of the tracks and so forth. So 
um, all of you who have watched this will have figured out that these were recorded um, sometime before today. I think it was Memorial Day and the day afterwards that I spent a number of hours um, immediately after we had the Oregon tune. So like in Texas at the moment, the temperature is really vari variable at this time of year. So um, it was really crucial that all of the organ pieces were tuned immediately after Larry Trupiano had been here to service the instrument. Um, and the harpsichord, we continue to, to tune it throughout the sessions. Um, so I was responsible not only for the playing, but also the videography and um, the audio, which was separate. And then all of you um, on the team of, of the Victoria Bach Festival then synced all of that information together. And uh, obviously these tracks couldn't be edited. So in some cases I, I was lucky and I was able to capture them in the very first go, um, especially the ones that I took upstairs from the balcony. I didn't have to go up and down the stairs too many times, but, um, but some of the more complex pieces, I would say the Couperin and uh, the Fantasy and Fugue in C minor on the organ, you know, I had to record them a number of times to get a take that I thought would be, you know, um, of a good enough level to broadcast tonight. So, um, so it was a very interesting process. And uh, it's really the first public opportunity that we have had to feature these instruments in our home. And um, th this particular pipe organ has a very interesting history. It's traveled far and wide. It was originally installed in 1960 in Pittsburgh, made its way to New York City, uh, for some time was in a bar in Chelsea in downtown New York City uh, and made its way eventually to St. Ignatius of Antioch Episcopal Church on the Upper West Side and eventually to St. Thomas More Church on the Upper East Side. And finally, I was able to acquire it from that um, location and it's moved a number of times with me since then. So uh, we're very grateful for this opportunity to have been able to feature this uh, wonderful instrument that indeed, as George said, is sort of a small version of the magnificent organ at Harvard uh, built by the same company by Flynn Trout. So. Well, it's a beautiful instrument and we can tell that you're good friends because it was such a gorgeous program tonight. You know, organ music is such a, such a physical thing for me and it's maybe hard to convey that in this format like this, but I felt it very much, it came through. So thank you so much for your gorgeous performances and all the videography and all the extra skills we're all having to learn now. So it really was a gorgeous program. So we miss you here in Victoria, but we really feel like we were together tonight. We so appreciate your generosity in inviting us in and showing your beautiful instruments. And uh, we do, if, if you out there enjoyed tonight's program, encourage you to go online to victoriabachfestival.org and help us make more beautiful music in the future. So Renee, George, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Be safe, be well, and thank you for the beautiful music. Take care. One. Thank you. <laughs>